Welcome to this video where we're going to be reviewing a paper from uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association. Now this is on the presenting characteristics and the comorbidities of a group of people. Now I know these detailed medical papers aren't for everyone so I'm going to give you the bottom line now so if you want to skip it you can do because they're quite hard, they're, uh, they're quite hard work to be quite honest. It's just taken me about two or three hours to work out what it's saying. They're not a simple read, but they're important to delve into from time to time because this is where we get valid information from. Usually written by doctors and academic colleagues who are actually doing the work and, and reviewed, peer-reviewed by other doctors and academics. So we end up with information that is reliable, valid, dependable information. So just to give you a few minutes before you, you might want to skip this video, 5,700 admissions in the New York area followed up over the course of about five weeks and over the course of the uh, study the the outcomes for just over two and a half thousand patients some were discharged some unfortunately died now what they found was the most common comorbidity was high blood pressure hypertension so people with high blood pressure are more likely to get serious disease were more likely to die the next one was obesity People that were overweight were more likely to get serious disease and more likely to die. And the third one was diabetes. Diabetes mellitus, or so-called sugar diabetes. And other comorbidities were coronary artery disease, poor circulation to the heart muscle, heart failure, where the heart's not pumping out enough blood to meet the metabolic demands of the body, asthma and uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, patients with cancers, was another one kidney disease liver disease people who had had or had were living with hiv and people who had had uh, transplants and the presenting characteristics were quite interesting only about a th uh, slightly less than a third actually when they went to hospital actually presented with a fever above 38 degrees centigrade so that's that's i would have expected more to have a significant fever than that um, only 20% had low oxygen saturations when they went to hospital. 17% had very rapid breathing, but 43% had rapid heart rates when they went to hospital. So some quite interesting points there, really. And, uh, and, and we know this is good quality Western collected data. So if you want to stick around for a bit more of that, fine. If you want to skip it, um, certainly won't be offended. But let, let's sort of go into this a bit in a bit more detail now. So... Um, <clears throat> this is the study, Journey of the American Medical Association. As always, I'll give you the link. You can check it all for yourself. So it's presenting characteristics, how these patients presented, and the comorbidities, the other diseases that they were suffering from, and the outcomes. And there was 5,700 patients admitted in this group of hospitals in and around uh, New York. So... Um, COVID-19 admitted to 12 hospitals in the New York and area. That's who they were studying. And it was sequentially hospitalised patients. In other words, they recruited every patient that was admitted to the hospital as they came in, into this study. So it was between the 1st of March and then the study concluded on the 4th of March 2020. And those dates are inclusive so fairly up-to-date data, accurately collected from New York and area. So a valid, a valid study here. Now, the patients had positive results on polymerase chain reaction. Now, this polymerase chain reaction, what happens is um, you take a sample and it's got some of the viral RNA in it because the, uh, the coronavirus is an RNA virus. But also when you, take a, when you take a throat sample, there's going to be all sorts of other stuff in there. There's going to be some of your own DNA. There's going to be bacterial DNA. There could even be other viral DNA in there. But we just want the RNA from the virus, the ribonucleic acid from the virus. So there's a, there's a, a reagent, a sort of a, a, an enzyme, increases the amount of RNA. So it greatly increases the amount of RNA. So you end up with lots of it, so it's much easier to identify. So it's this polymerase chain reaction. Chain reaction, increasing the amount of coronavirus RNA to make it easy to identify. And uh, this is the standard antigen test for the virus that we've known about for some time. Uh, and it's a nasopharyngeal, so uh, naso 
pharyngeal. So the, the nasopharynx is the bit right at the back of your nose. So it's not the front of the nose. It's that kind of tube at the back that connects your mouth down, connects your nose down into your mouth. So quite an unpleasant swab to take, really, to be quite honest. But everyone had a nasopharyngeal swab that required admission. Now, this is interesting because there's quite a lot of talk about the validity of these tests and the accuracy of these tests. So the first test for COVID-19 was positive in uh, 5,517 patients, which is 96.8. So pretty well 97% of patients who had the infection did in fact test positive. In other words, there was a fairly low false negative rate of 3.2%. Now, we know there were false negatives because these remaining patients were subsequently tested and they were found to have the virus on subsequent testing, on repeat testing. But what we can say is this polymerase chain reaction antigen test for the virus is a pretty reliable test, 96.8% reliability so that's somewhat reassuring that we have got a, a reliable test for the presence of the uh the covid19 coronavirus now what were the results from this study now as we said 5700 patients now the median age of the patients was 63 so that's that's the one in the middle isn't it 63 now the interquartile range in other words, 50% of the sample, 50% of the 5,700 were between the ages of 52 and 75. So that means 25% were younger than 52, 25% were older than 75, and 50% were in this 52 to 75 year old age group. Now remember, this is just the patients admitted to hospital. So 39.7% were female. In other words, 60%, 60.3% is it, were male. So we see more men being admitted to hospital than women because we know that men get more, men are more likely to get more severe COVID-19 disease. Now the comorbidities were interesting and largely it has to be said this data from New York is essentially in agreement with the early Chinese data from Chinese studies. But it's interesting from two points of view. First of all, there was debate about the validity of some of the early Chinese studies. Although way back in February, I was saying that they did seem to be well-conducted studies. And that is looking likely now because the American data is, is collaborating that. So it's good to collaborate the data. Um, Someone once said that the closest we come to truth is multiple collaborations. <laughs> so that the more thing, the more papers that agree, <coughs> clearly the better it is. <clears throat> so that, that's that's a good thing. And also there was a question mark in the early days as to whether this disease would present differently in different races. So a lot of the early data, of course, was on people from China. So would people from America present the same as people from China? Or would there be difference for racial reasons? And the answer is they seem to present pretty well the same, pretty well the same. So it doesn't seem to be racially selective, although we know that uh, African-Americans do tend to get more severe disease than white Americans. But what did they find? Now, I know these percentages don't always add up to the, uh, the 5,700, because what happens is they don't always have data for all of the patients in every time they do an analysis. But if you work them out, and I have done, they're actually pretty close. So um, they had most of them. So it's probably best to go with the percentages. So of those admitted to hospital, 56.6% had high blood pressure. So more than half had high blood pressure. So no question that hypertension has always been found to be a significant comorbidity. People with high blood pressure are more at risk from severe COVID-19 disease. Obesity was quite a quite a strong one here as well. But there again, quite a lot of the population of uh, New York is obese anyway, uh, or overweight. Diabetes was 33.8%. Uh, 
So they were the three main comorbidities they found in that order, hypertension, obesity, diabetes. And of course, the other reason that these add up to more than 100 is that these are all features of what is some, sometimes called, this is diabetes type 2, of course. These are all features of what is sometimes called metabolic syndrome, or they can be features of metabolic syndrome, which are characterized by these features, especially abdominal obesity often accompanied by high uh, blood glucose, of course, from the diabetes, and often accompanied by dyslipidemia, where the um, low-density lipoproteins are relatively high and the protective high-density lipoproteins are relatively low. And, of course, this puts these people at risk of things like arterial disease, heart attacks and strokes. So um, that's not too surprising, really. Now, we're going to look at more comorbidities. There are quite a few more. And we did look at a few of those in the introduction, but we're going to look at those on a table in a little more detail. But we, we did notice that there's cancer, HIV, kidney disease, liver disease, and other, other diseases as well. But these were the top three. Now, at triage, now triage is the procedure that's carried out when someone's first admitted to hospital. So um, we, we, we normally take them into a triage room and do, the, do their basic observations, their, their vital signs, temperature, pulse, blood pressure. Um, respiratory rate, um, oxygen saturations, level of pain. Now at triage, this was this surprised me a little. Being brought into hospital, only about less than a third had a fever. Less than a third had a fever. Now what the paper doesn't tell us is how many of these patients took antipyretics before they came in, such as ibuprofen or uh, paracetamol. That's acetaminophen or Tylenol. So it may be that they've been taking these medicines to artificially lower their fevers. Or it may be that few of them did present actually with a fever. But the fever does seem to come and go in COVID-19. So, you know, you can catch people with a fever or other times they don't seem to have so much of a fever. But relatively low on triage. Uh, only 17.3%, although it's quite significant for them, had a very rapid breathing, what we call tachypnea. So uh, greater than uh, 24 breaths per minute. We normally say 12 to 20 is the normal. And uh, 20, so 27.8, it looks like the triage nurse was uh, worried about them uh, in 20, 27, 28% of the time that they wanted to put extra oxygen on, give them extra oxygen at triage. What, to what degree that was absolutely indicated or to what degree it was the triage people being cautious, um, we, we don't really know. Um, a, a greater proportion of this, I haven't got it there, but a greater proportion of this had a, had a rapid heart rate, a tachycardia as well. But tachycardia is common in any form of infection, really. So, again, nothing too surprising there, really. Now... The respiratory virus co-infection rate was 2.1%. Um, now, this is not surprising for the time of year because we were, what, what dates were we at here? We were at um, March to April. So we're at the, still, still in the flu season, in the influenza season, really. So tail end of the influenza season. So it's not surprising that some people had a, a, an additional respiratory virus at the time. But the trouble is we know this is associated with a worse prognosis. And this is a major concern if there's a, ma if there's a second wave next autumn and next winter. That's the winter of uh, 2020 20, uh, to, to 2021. Um, that there could be a lot of people with influenza who also contract COVID-19 and that's associated with a, with a, with a poor prognosis. Now, what were the outcomes from this particular study? So remember, we kicked off with, uh, we started off with 5,700 patients. Well, um, 2,634 patients had died or had been discharged by the end of the study, which was the 4th of April. So that means that 3,000, oh, just over 3,000 remain in hospital. So basically, we haven't got, all we can say about those is they were ill for longer than the study period. Of course, that doesn't tell us when in the study period they were admitted. They could have been in for well over four weeks or they could have just come in the, the day before. Now, during hospitalisation um, of, of this group where there's an outcome, approximately of this group where there's an outcome, 
although as I say data is not available for every single one of them but during hospitalization 14.2 percent of these patients for whom an outcome was determined needed intensive therapy unit so that means they needed more advanced organ support 14 percent but of course that's 14 percent of the group that were already iller already more sick because they were already admitted to hospital and the ones that uh, went to intensive care these had a median age of 68 so we see we see it's older people that are more likely to be admitted to intensive care and we also see that only a third of them were female that means two-thirds of them were male so two-thirds of the patients that needed intensive care were male so way more men than women requiring uh, intensive care two to one 33 percent 66 percent of those requiring intensive care were male now um <clears throat> 320, that's 12.2% of those discharged or died, received invasive mechanical ventilation. So 14% um, required intensive care. That means a couple of those got away with, a few percent there got away without mechanical ventilation. 12.2% uh, did require invasive mechanical ventilation with a tube put down the throat and air blown in endotracheal intubation or, or possibly tracheostomy uh, formation where a, a breathing pipe is put directly into the windpipe so it's quite high numbers really and, and as we'll see intubation was associated with a pretty bad prognosis especially in the older groups uh, 81 3.2 percent were treated with kidney replacement therapy so 3.2 percent developed a degree of kidney failure where they couldn't make sufficient urine of sufficiently good quantity and quality to get rid of the toxins that the body was being was producing and to maintain uh, the homeostatic balance of the blood in things like potassium and sodium levels and uh, 553 to 553 21% um, of this group where an outcome was known died during the course of the study now, of course, as we said, the study cut off on the 4th of April, so more will have died since. But there again, the patients that were still alive at the end of the study were likely to be fitter anyway. So even though more of those will go on to die, the actual proportion of those that went on to die we would expect to be less than the proportion that had died in the first part of the study. You see why these, patients, these papers get a bit complicated. <laughs> anyway, I think we're doing OK so far, so let's, uh, let's press on. Well done if you're still with it. Um, for patients discharged alive, the lowest absolute lymphocyte count during hospital course. Right, for, so right. What this is saying is, so these, these lymphocytes are the protective white blood cells. So it's the lymphocytes the lymphocytes that produce the immune proteins, the antibodies. And it's the antibodies that go on to kill the virus. So it's the antibodies that take out the, the virus. So can you see without the antibodies, you can't take out the virus. Without the lymphocytes, you can't make the antibodies. And some patients had a low lymphocyte count. And the older someone was, the more likely their lymphocyte count was to be low. So increasing age was increased with us was associated with increasing risk for low lymphocyte counts therefore they can't make the antibodies therefore they can't kill the virus therefore they're more likely to get severe complications and die so for patients discharged alive the lowest absolute lymphocyte count during hospital course was lower for progressively older age groups so the older someone is the more likely they are to have low lymphocyte counts which can go a long way to accounting for the increased death rate in older patients. Now, mortality rates for those who received the mechanical ventilation. Now, even in the younger age group, <clears throat> in the 18 to 65s, if they received mechanical ventilation, still 76% of them died. 
So only 24% or so survived. So those that were ill enough to need mechanical ventilation went on to die or died from effects of the mechanical ventilation. It's always going to be a combination of those two. And in the older age group, people older than 65, 97.2% died. This is one reason why doctors these days are now are very reluctant to intubate and ventilate because, especially in the older age group, they're going to die anyway. Good news, no deaths in the younger than 18 year old age group. So that was that was good. So as of the 4th of April, <clears throat> um, altogether 20% of the original, 20% required mechanical ventilation. 3.3% were discharged alive, relatively small, unfortunately, in the time span. 24.5% died and 72% remained in hospital. And 4, 45, that's 2.2% of patients, were readmitted during the study period. So what this means is that some patients were discharged and then some of those had to be readmitted. Um, not entirely surprising because we know people can deteriorate in the second week and the third week of the illness, so that can happen. Now, one of the problems we've had with this association with high blood pressure. We know people with high blood pressure are more likely to get um, complications. So we, we know that. People with, with high blood pressure are more likely to get complications, more likely to die. But is it the fact that their blood pressure is high or is it the fact they're being treated for the high blood pressure that causes the increased risk? And the answer to that is this study doesn't quite tell us, but, but let's look at some information here that's interesting. Now, people with high blood pressure not taking angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or angiotensin 2 receptor blockers. That, so the, 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 so ACE, inhibit, ACE inhibitors or ARBs are, are two types of anti-high uh, anti blood pressure medication. They're, they're what we call hypotensive agents. They lower blood pressure. So of those with high blood pressure and not taking medication... 26.7% died. Those taking uh, ACE inhibitors, that, that's drugs like captopril, lisinopril, um, anything that ends in pril is an ACE inhibitor. Um, people taking ACE inhibitors, the death rate was higher. And people taking ARBs, that's drugs like candesartin and low, 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 low candesartin and losartin, drugs that end in sartin, S A R T A N. Um, again, more of those died than, than weren't being treated. So from that data, it's tempting to say that patients that were being treated for their high blood pressure with these particular preparations are more likely to die than patients whose blood pressure was not being treated. But the patients who were admitted not taking medicine for their high blood pressure, it may well be that the blood pressure was a bit high, but their doctors had decided not to treat them because the blood pressure wasn't high as, as high as the blood pressure in these two groups. So these two groups here, because they're being treated, may have had a, a higher blood pressure, a much higher blood pressure without treatment than that group. So that, that's possible. And these differences aren't huge. So what the group actually concluded was it's not possible to pick out whether it is the high blood pressure or the treatment for the high blood pressure that causes the increased morbidity and, uh, and mortality. So still needing further data for that. And if the group who wrote the paper say they can't differentiate, then I certainly can't either. Now, um, if you want to stick with it, there's a few interesting, a few more interesting points to show you here. Um, so this data here is uh, baseline characteristics. So this is the age. Uh, we see more males than females. Now, the racial split here is interesting. So 22 
0.6% were African American. But I don't know what percentage of the local population is African American anyway. That's probably not too far off the percentage. I don't know. So we can't really get too much from that. Um, Hispanics, um, probably at greater risk, I would say. But again, we don't know. <coughs> we, don't, we don't know the number in the population as a whole. That's their insurance status. Now, these were the comorbidities. So cancer was one. That, so um, that's, these are percentages, aren't they? So um, total number of cases, 6% had cancers. High blood pressure, we know a lot had high blood pressure, coronary artery disease and congestive heart failure, relatively uh, high comorbidities. But of course, th these two, can, can, the hypertension is an etiological, it's a causative factor in these two. So again, hard to tease out. Asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is a combination of... Um, is a combination of... Um, chronic bronchitis and uh, emphysema. Uh, collectively, we call it chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And sleep apnea, where people have difficulty... Sleep apnea, people can sort of wake up gasping overnight and need to sometimes wake up or stand up or even sometimes walk around before they can breathe again properly. HIV, as you would expect. In the New York area, this is interesting because it's a relatively small percentage um, but in the New York area, most patients, as far as I know, are fairly well managed on antiretroviral therapy, therefore would have relatively low uh, HI viral loads. So the degree to which HIV AIDS is a problem may well depend on the viral load of uh, the, the human immunodeficiency virus. And the better the person is complying with antiretroviral therapy, the lower that viral load will be. And this is particularly interesting for the African situation where um, ARBs are not as well taken as they are in the United States. So this could be more of a problem in the Africa situation and that could be higher. These are patients who had organ transplants. The thing about organ transplants is not so much the organ, it's the fact that they need to take immunosuppressing medication to prevent the body from rejecting the donated organ. Uh, kidney disease, chronic, and uh, this means end stage is the most severe form of um, chronic kidney disease. Liver disease caused by cirrhosis, which is fibrous tissue forming in the liver. Hepatitis B and C, viral infections of the liver, which can cause liver damage. Uh, this metabolic disease, so obesity, um, extreme obesity and uh, diabetes as we looked at before. Most patients never smoked so that, that was encouraging and of course quite a few people had in fact that's more than one so 88% had more than one comorbidity so that means they had diabetes and high blood pressure or diabetes and heart disease and high blood pressure so most of them had more than one comorbidity. So it's reasonable to assume that if someone has more than one comorbidity, the risk of severe COVID-19 or indeed death from COVID-19 increases, uh, increases proportionately. Now, what do I want to do now? That'll probably do. There, 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 are, there are some other things I could show you, but uh, I think we'll leave it there for now. Okay.